Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I pray that prayer because my pastor that I grew up under, you may know this, it's a psalm written by King David, and I pray that every time because the pastor I grew up under prayed that every time. And we're creatures of habit, aren't we? So, um, and every time I try to change it up, it just goes weird. So, uh, anyways, how's the Bible reading going for those of you who are eating this book? Uh, the marathoners amongst us, the ones that are trying to read the whole thing this year. You guys doing okay? Jeremiah, Ezekiel, a little hard. Ezekiel's a weird book. Some hard words in that book. We'll look at Ezekiel the next two weeks. Today, we're looking at Jeremiah. We're looking at the book of hope. There's four chapters of hope in the book of Jeremiah, which is 52 chapters long and 5% of your Bible. And only a small percentage of that book has much hope in it. Um, And we're going to take a look at chapter 31, uh, beginning in verse 31, so you can find Jeremiah. Whenever you open your Bible, do you find you're either in the book of Jeremiah or in Psalms? Yeah, it's because they're so long. Um, For those of you who aren't doing the marathon, but I hope and pray that you're picking up your Bible and reading it every single day. That's the goal, to get you in the habit of reading the scriptures. If you fell behind, that's all right. You can jump right back in. I would advise that if you are more than a week or two behind. Do not try to catch up. Um, I did that last year. Last year, I tried to read Calvin's Institutes. Uh, I had a daily reading for every single day of the year. Calvin's Institute is about 1,500 pages long. I uh, got behind. Like, I got, first it was a week, you know, and then you get a two weeks behind, and then you get a month behind. And uh, I think today's reading is August 15 from 2018. So... Um, I'm really far behind, but I've been, you know, I've been slowly going along, and uh, so that's that's the best thing you can do with these really long books, uh, is to just keep plugging away. Today, uh, I'm I, I, for a while this past week, I've had a brain freeze. I've I've had not a slurpy brain freeze, but more like. More like, I wish it was that. I've had more like writer's block with these sermons. The wisdom literature was just so awesome, and I really just dove into that probably because I'm midlife, and for the first time in my life, Ecclesiastes made sense, you know, because it's like, yeah, life is hevel. That makes total sense now. Um, When I was a young man, I thought, oh, everything will be great, and everything will turn out how I planned, and yeah, that didn't happen so much. Um, in ways it did, in ways God surprised me, in other ways I totally let myself down. But Ecclesiastes made sense. Then we get back to the prophets, and I'm like, oh my gosh, the prophets, like, it's like take your thumb and just continue to hit it with a hammer, you know? I mean, that's what the prophets can feel like. And so I've had a difficult time getting into it, but I've got to say that I, it, it finally clicked in the last... 36, 48 hours for me with this chapter, and I'm really excited now to bring to you this book of Jeremiah. I lied a little bit. I said we're going to be in 31. That's where we're going to focus. That's where we're going to camp out, but I want to kind of bring you up to speed as to what's going on. So the book of Jeremiah was written by, there you go, right? Now you know something about the Bible. Uh, It was written by a guy named Jeremiah. He's the man of sorrows. He uh, was called by God. Some scholars think he might have been called even in his youth, perhaps a young boy. Um, He came about during the reign of King Josiah, who also came to the throne when he was eight years old. So how crazy would that have been if God's two dudes were a king who's eight and a prophet who's like eight to ten or something? (laughs) It's just, what was God thinking, right? And then you look at me and you're like, what was God thinking? (laughs) 
And Jeremiah, uh, he has a ministry of prophecy for 40 years. And so the book that we have, this collection, is not chrono- chronological. It's a little frustrating that way. Uh, and the Hebrews, they liked chronological stuff. We really like chronological stuff. It's more thematic is how it's arranged. And so the first chapter 1 through 29 is all that Israel has done wrong. And it's just these pronouncements of, you guys are off the reservation and you're in the weeds and you're making bad choices. In fact, uh, chapter 7, just to give a feel, or excuse me, chapter 2, has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. That's basically the gist of God's frustration, his anger, his wrath, his rage at Israel is their idolatry. If you keep reading chapter 2, it gets really graphic. It's like you're like a wild she-donkey out in the wilderness and your nose is to the scent and any uh, wild male donkey that finds you. I mean, it's just like, whoa, why are we talking about wild donkeys and heat of donkeys? And God's angry. And he continues to, to consider and to see Israel like a promiscuous, wayward wife. And this is shocking to us. But in the ancient world, this would have been unheard of. I mean, it's just utterly shocking to them. So God's angry because of their idolatry and their idolatry following other gods has led them to not obey other parts of the law. So it's kind of like if you fail at the very first one, remember the the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not have any other gods before me, right? I mean, that's like the numero uno big one, right? The second one is like it. Thou shalt not make any graven images and they're doing both of these and we're going to trace their history a little bit here in a bit to to see they've been doing this since day one they're just off the reservation they're in the weeds they are utterly faithless to god and so god has for 500 years (laughs) anybody struggle with patience God for 500 plus years has been incredibly long-suffering and patient with these people. Generation after generation after generation after idiot after idiot after idiot, right? I mean, the divine perspective on this has just got to be like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. It's train wreck after train wreck after train wreck. And so his plan is this, I will summon, this is uh, Jeremiah 25, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. I will banish them. I will banish from them the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, the sound of millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So God's plan is pretty bleak. And for 40 years, Jeremiah brings these prophecies You are serving other gods. You're going to go into Babylon. Not quite 40 years. He was shy of that because he actually lived through the exile. And many scholars believe that Jeremiah may have been the writer of Lamentations as well. We're not sure, but he could have also penned Lamentations. He lives through the exile. He sees Jerusalem, the temple, the palace, the houses of the wealthy and the elite, the wall destroyed by the Babylonians. And he stays there. And he weeps with his people. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, so here in chapter 25, 
a glimpse of hope. I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation. The land of the Babylonians for their guilt declares the Lord and will make it desolate forever. Anybody been to Iraq? That's the land of the Babylonians. They go to exile. And in exile, like last week, Jeremiah 29, we see that Jeremiah writes him a letter because there's some competing prophets. <laughs> there's one that's saying, hey, don't get too comfortable. Stay in your tent. Keep your bedroll ready to go. You're coming back in two years' time. And Jeremiah sends a letter and the Pony Express arrives in Babylon and they get the letter and they read it and, they, and it says, build houses, settle down, marry, have your kids get married, be sure you get some grandkids because you're going to be there for 70 years. So the older folks weep because they ain't coming back home. And the middle schoolers weep because now they got to transition to a strange, weird Babylonian culture. And it is just devastating. This is such an earth-shattering experience for the Israelites that this shapes the rest of our scriptures. It's actually in the crucible of the exile that they begin to gather together the writings of Jeremiah, of Amos, of Obadiah, all the prophets they did not listen to, as Jesus said, I kept sending you prophets and you killed them and you ignored them and you didn't listen to them. And so the landowner says, I'll send my son, right? It's a minority report. Nobody liked what was being told by these people. But when you have 70 years in Babylon, you start to reconsider their words. You start to hear them and you go, ah, oh, I think they're right. I think they knew what they were talking about. And you start to grab those words and you start to, to look through them for any notes of hope. You start to put them together and you start to form your religion around something other than the temple because it's gone. And you start to form your religion around the writings, the scrolls, the sacred stories. So you assemble Genesis, you assemble Exodus, you start to assemble all these writings and you put them together. And right at the beginning of the book, Ex or Genesis 1, 2, 3, you get a story about how all humanity is in exile. We are all far from our home, the garden. We are all exiled from God. And then God's going to fix this by choosing one man, Abram. And through this family, he's going to bring about blessing to the world. And then you keep reading time and time and time and time again. And you're, if you're like me, you've been eating this book for half a year now. We're halfway done. Do you realize that? We are halfway through this thing. And you're like... When are they going to get it right? Where's the snake crusher? How is this going to be resolved? Is anybody going to win? Or does sin and stupidity and idiotic idiotcy? That's a new word I just created. You may not know this. I was George W. Bush's speechwriter back in the day. <laughs> Strategery was my word. I came up with that. So they find this Jeremiah 31. And in verse 31, they read, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Is that still up there? No. When I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. This is the only place in the entire Old Testament that we get this phrase, new covenant, is in this passage. The only place and it's in red because it is a major hyperlink okay and we're going to see that in a bit because uh, jesus picks up on this and riffs on this the book of hebrews picks up on riffs on this and we're going to take a look at both of those places but do you notice who the new covenant is for with the people of israel you expect israel right but remember when this was written this is written after the kingdom of Israel is no more. It's gone. Some of the people who lived in the northern kingdom of Israel before the Assyrians came in and took them out, some of those people 
made their way down into the southern kingdom of Judah, I'm sure. Many of them were scattered. Some of them were drugged back into uh, exiles. Some were scattered and fled for their lives, and they went all over the place because the Assyrians were one of the most brutal regimes, one of the most brutal empires the world has ever seen. The people ran for their lives, and they were no more. But God says, I'm making a new covenant with the northern kingdom, those ten tribes of Israel, and with the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, that still exist in the south and now are in exile, some of them. This is a new covenant. Now, if you remember, as we've been looking at the Old Testament, I gave you kind of a, a, a framework to hang all this stuff on, right? So we have the Noahic covenant. So every time you see a rainbow, right? You remember, oh, Noahic covenant. And the Noahic covenant is this. God's never going to wipe us all out again. And the part of that covenant is he has committed himself to suboptimal strategies for dealing with us. <laughs> That's a big part of that covenant. So part of that covenant is we can eat animals. That wasn't necessarily God's plan, but I'm thankful for it because I really, really like animal meat, right? Really enjoy the ribs I had on July 4th, right? And if I was Jewish, I'd have to kiss those goodbye, right? So thankful I'm a Gentile, thankful for the Noahic covenant, right? And it meant that God has to commit to suboptimal strategies for dealing with us because the best strategy would be just wipe them all out and start all over, right? Like that Bill Cosby joke. I had one just like you, or I, you know, I brought you into the world and I'll take you out. And I'll have one just like you, right? God could ultimately do that. No way covenant commits to keep us around. Then we have the Abrahamic covenant where God makes a covenant with Abraham and he says, whoever you bless, I will bless. Whoever you curse, I will curse. I will make a great nation out of you. Go outside, look at the stars. Just like the stars shining in the universe, you're going to be as numerous as them. You're going to have the quality or the quantity of stars. But I think there's another, uh, uh, another thing he's promising there. You're going to have the quality of stars. We're going to see in the book of Daniel, Daniel 7, Daniel riffs on that. <laughs> and Paul picks that up too in his writings. And then we have the Mosaic Covenant. We're going to look at that in depth a little bit here in a moment because you're eating lunch here so you don't have to hurry and beat anybody in line. The Mosaic Covenant, Exodus 19 through 31, God gives them the covenant, all the ways that he's going to covenant with them, be present with them, live amongst the people. Then we get the Davidic covenant. God creates the covenant with David, and he says, I will establish your house. I will establish your throne. There will always be a king of Israel on the throne of David from you, David, right? These are the great covenants of the Old Testament. And here, Jeremiah 31, God says, what? It's in red. New covenant. New covenant, right? So let's read about this new covenant. It will not be like the covenant I made with your ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. So which covenant is he talking about? He's talking about the Mosaic covenant, okay? Because that's when he came in Egypt. He rescued the people out of Egypt by Moses. Let my people go. Charlton Heston had a great Moses impersonation on TV, right? He brings the people out. They go to Mount Sinai because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. There's a reason I'm emphasizing the I part. And they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord. Because they will all know me. <laughs> Could you imagine that? Some of you, your neighbors need to know the Lord, right? I mean, like, you got some neighbors, right? I got some neighbors. My neighbor, he really likes illegal fireworks. And my other neighbor is not so thrilled about illegal fireworks, so he turned to the one neighbor, he's like, hey, those are illegal! You know, after a big, huge explosion, you know? <laughs> and it's like, what do you say to that? Yep, thank you, you know? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like, you know, World War III is going on in the neighborhood. And then God decided, I'm going to have some fun and make some fireworks for y'all, right? And then that kind of brought it to an end. Thunder, lightning, rain, no way covenant. Whoa, cool. But in this new covenant, my neighbors will know the Lord. I won't have to be the one telling them, hey, you need to know the Lord. They'll just know. That sounds like a pretty cool covenant. Because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The omniscient, knowing everything God will now like have selective husband-like memory. Yeah. <laughs> right? I'll remember their sins. He called himself a husband, so maybe that's how it works. I will remember their sins no more. Now, how is he going to pull off this covenant? How is he going to do this new covenant? This sounds like a great covenant. This sounds awesome. This sounds very needed. As we've been reading through this book, it's clear there's a bunch of knuckleheads in the world and they need some help. Well, did you hear all the eyes? I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. God himself will have to come and initiate this new covenant. God himself is going to do this. Now, it's interesting because we have some hyperlinks in this. And one of the hyperlinks is he's talking about this Mosaic covenant. And so this just popped out to me this past week as I was studying. And I, you need to hear this. This is so cool. It's going to change, hopefully, something for you. I don't know. Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32 is the golden calf incident. And Moses has been up on Mount Sinai for like 40 days. The people are starting to go, maybe he's dead up there. I mean, look at the storm cloud. <laughs> like, who can survive that? They're looking at God's presence from afar. You know, lightning, thunder, <laughs> big fire on the mountain. It's crazy. It's like, how on earth could the dude survive that? He's been gone so long. Hey, Aaron, his brother, how about you build some stuff for us? Uh, okay, what do you want me to build? Uh, let's build, let's just get all our jewelry, our earrings together, melt them down, see what pops out of the fire. They make a golden calf, right? They make a golden calf. And the Lord said to Moses, go down, and then look at the, look at the pronoun usage. This is important because whose people? Whose people are these? Aren't these God's people? not at this point <laughs> right you ever done this with your kids you know like with your wife your kids are like totally messing up here at the church right now you know and then she like tries to well you played a part in that and it's like well, yeah but they're your kids right now <laughs> they got your last name okay good point Go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt, which is totally contrary to what we've been learning about this covenant, the people you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. What was the first commandment? I have no other God before me. What was the second one? Make no images. Bam, 40 days into the covenant, 40 stinking days. You couldn't even pull off two months, you know? sounds like me with my new year's resolutions right it sounds like me when i'm like yeah i'm gonna work out every day you know and like go for like a month and it's like man steve you couldn't even pull out 40 days like it's hard chocolate's delicious <laughs> make kale awesome and i'll probably be better at it you know wasn't my idea i mean it's like whose covenant was that made this idol they have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said these are your gods i mean knuckleheads who brought you up out of egypt i have seen these people the lord said to moses and they are a stiff necked people now leave me alone <laughs> that is a great line isn't it god says to moses now leave me alone <laughs> husbands you been there ever <laughs> don't leave me alone right so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them, then I will make you into a great nation. Wow. How does Moses handle this 
But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, sounds like he's not a good listener. God said, what? Leave me alone. What does Moses do? Hey, uh, Lord, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Okay, how many of you think this is nuts that the guy who was just told by God to leave him alone is not leaving him alone? How does that story go for you, husbands? What happens? I said, leave me alone. Right? I mean, this is the God of creation, and the guy is not, you know, it's like, what's going to, it's like, is Moses going to get it? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give you descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. That's a weird passage. And it has confounded people forever. <laughs> because the word there, that's translated relent. Does anybody have the old King James or another? It says repented. And that's what the Hebrew actually means. It, it means that God changed in some way. And who changed God? Moses. Moses was a human intercessor between the people of Israel who are down sinning, making calves, and between God who decides, I think I'm going to kill them all. And I'm going to start over with you, Moses. I brought them into the world, and I'll take them out, and I'll make another one just like them through Moses. Moses goes down. You, you've seen the movie, right? He's a little angry, throws down the tablets, uh, he has to climb all the way back up there for more tablets. The next day, Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for you. Atonement for your sin. Perhaps I can make things right between you and God. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. Now listen to what he says here. But now, please forgive their sin. But if not, if you're not willing to forgive their sin, then kill me. Then blot me out of the book you have written. Kill me in their place. Any kind of bells and whistles or something's going on in your brain? Hey, this sounds like a story I'm a little more familiar with. You see, Moses becomes this design pattern by the authors. He's a design pattern that we're supposed to pick up and we're supposed to see and we're supposed to go, oh, substitution. Somebody dying in the place of others. Moses offers himself for the people. But look how it's worded. Please forgive their sin, right? Please forgive their sin. Like just... Just forgive their sin. God, can't you just forgive their sin or does somebody have to die in the process, right? And he says, if you can't do it, if you can't just forgive sin, then kill me instead of them. What happens? Nobody gets killed. Actually, God sends out a plague. It says in the next verse, God sends a plague out against the people. So some folks die, <laughs> but not everybody and not Moses. And so God, in some way, forgives without killing anybody. But he doesn't forget. He keeps bringing this incident up time and time and time again. But there's this design pattern right there in the giving of the old covenant. This is huge. You need to hang this on into your mind. Are you with me? Just nod your head and make me feel better. Because we're going to go to a book in Hebrews here in a bit. First, though, we just did this thing here at church. Jesus instituted at the Last Supper. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, and what did he say? This cup is the new covenant. Hyperlink. That's what we're learning about. Jer Jeremiah 31, 31 tells us about the new covenant. And the covenant was supposed to be with who? Israel 
and Judah, what has happened? Who hears from Israel? Who hears from Judah? Who let you in? Who let me in? How is this happening? Right? Seems like the covenant got a little broader. It became more available to others. So let's try to find some information here. This is Hebrews chapter 13, very end of the book of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, again, that's, that's one way of referring to the new covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good, everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now it's interesting, uh, whenever you hear that word shepherd of the sheep, um, we get pictures of like green fields and a shepherd and he's like coddling little sheep. I want you to know that's a terrible way of picturing that. That is not how the ancient people thought of a shepherd. Shepherd was the word used for kings and those in authority. Shepherd was used for leaders. Shepherds were used about those who had leadership and authority and they would tell you what to do. It's not that he's here to kiss my boo-boos. He's here to make everything okay. This is a way of saying he's king. This is the ancient way of saying he's king. And you will do what the king demands, sheep, won't you? I mean, that's what is going on here. This is an appeal to his, his authority, his leadership. That was free. Hebrews chapter 8. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs. He's talking about the, the Mosaic covenant. As the covenant of which he is mediator, Jesus is mediator of this new covenant, is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. Okay, that was a little convoluted. Let's keep reading. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, right, the Mosaic covenant, that first covenant at Sinai, no place would have been sought for another. If it was perfect, if it worked, if it did what it was supposed to do, we wouldn't need a new covenant. But God found fault with the people. I don't like that translation. There's actually a textual variant here. In the NIV, which I'm reading from, and the ESV and some other uh, translations put the fault on the people. But I like how the Net Bible and how uh, the Message Bible bring it about. Uh, this is also verse, let's see, sorry, lost my place. This is verse 8, where it says, For there, if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant. Okay, do you see what's going on here? In Greek, word order doesn't matter. <laughs> so imagine learning that language, okay? In English, word order is really, really important. So in, in the word order, having found something wrong with, Right In English, what comes next? That's really important. With the covenant, with the people. In Greek, there's ways to show this without word order. And there's a textual argument going on in this passage. And I think this makes better sense to render it this way. That there is something that has been found wrong with the first covenant. Not with the people. We already knew that about the people. We didn't need this covenant to explain us that we got something wrong with us. Something wrong with the covenant. And so what's going on is God's going to answer this. Now look at this. This is a quote. This is the longest quote of, a New Test or of an Old Testament passage in the New Testament. The longest quote of an Old Testament passage in the New Testament is right here. And guess what they're quoting? Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Longest quote. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. But showing, uh, buh, 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 I don't know what happened there. But we know the first was found, oh my gosh, everything's messed up. 
There we go. It will be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. We've already read this, right? This is that quote from Jeremiah. And he goes on. Uh, that's the same quote. He goes on and says, By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Now, a lot of times we read this as Christians and we come along and we go, Yeah, Old Testament's terrible. Eh, it's icky. It's gross. We don't like it. It's weird. New Testament, yeah, Steve needs to preach out of Paul way more, right? Which I don't, because I don't understand Paul half the time. But that's not what he's saying. It's more like this. He's saying, it's old, it's outdated, it's obsolete. That's a cool Model T. Would you want to drive to California in that Model T? That'd be a long drive. If you accidentally hit something in the parking lot, what are you hitting it with? The tires. There ain't no bumper on that thing. Where's the airbag? <laughs> AC? Don't think so. I think you can go 75 miles an hour on a regular basis in that thing. It's a cool car. We like it. We learned from it. And then Ford in 2019 came out with this. Same company. Would you like to take this to California? <laughs> what was wrong with the Model T? Right? Those kids know what's up, right? It's like, think I can go 75? Well, maybe we can keep it at 75, right? Man, that's a cool car. Now look what the author says here in Hebrews chapter 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. The Model T is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. Right? I mean, it's not that the Model T was bad. That was the first car that the masses could buy, they could own. All of a sudden, we're going from horse and buggy to automobile. And thank God, because I'm pretty sure I'd be walking if we were still horse and buggy people, because horses don't like me. They started it. I don't like them, but they started it. They got attitude. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. What Moses saw up on that mountain, I mean, all the stuff that he got understanding from, listen, look how it keeps going. This is exciting. You don't feel excited. For this reason, it can never be the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year. Make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. Up on the mountaintop, Moses gets a long list of all these sacrifices, right? And then God keeps adding to them in the book of Leviticus. We get all this information. Okay, when you build a tabernacle, you can't go in there. Not just anybody can go in there. Only one person can go in there, and they got to make sure that they're not going to be... And then right after we read that warning, somebody goes in there and dies, Told you, like I'm telling you people, right? It's like parenting, you know, except nobody dies in parenting. Maybe they should sometimes. Right? And you're frustrated and you're like, oh my gosh, they're not getting it. They're not, not listening. And then we keep reading in the Old Testament that there's not even forgiveness of the big sins. Like there's no way to forgive somebody for murdering somebody. There's no way to forgive somebody for adultery. There's no way to forgive anybody. You can either make restitution, like pay the guy off, 
or be stoned to death. There's no options. You cannot be forgiven. If we keep reading, we read this here in Hebrews. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That whole system couldn't take away sin. What that system did was it made you pure. So I want, I want you to picture it this way. Have you ever been to the hospital? Unfortunately, right? You go to the hospital. I mean, there's some good times you go to the hospital, like babies born and stuff, but there's a lot of times where it's not the favorite place in the world. And you go in the, to the hospital, and on the door it says, if you are coughing, sneezing, oozing stuff, don't come in here, right? Our word for that would be infected or unclean, and they don't want you visiting the already infected people because they're having a hard enough time getting those people out of there. And they don't need you and your sniffly nose showing up, right? And if you show up and you got a sniffly, runny nose, what do they do? They give you like oh, this little thing here, right? And you're like, okay, I can't talk to anybody and this is really strange and it's weird, but... And if they have... If they are infected or impure, the person that you are wanting to go see, what do you do? You gown up, you get gloves on, you get a little thing on your face. You see, that is far more what the sacrifices in the Old Testament were doing. I don't understand. They weren't forgiving the sin because we just read it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to forgive sin. What they were doing was they were putting on sanitation on the person, making you ready to go into God's presence. Because you don't just waltz into God's presence. You could be contaminated. And if you're contaminated, what happens when you're in God's presence? Fire breaks out. <laughs> Consumes you, right? But people have to do stuff in the tabernacle. It's part of the law. The people of Israel have to be close to God's presence. That's the whole plan. That's why God made the tabernacle, so he could dwell with the people. Trouble is, people get infections. People do things stupid. People step in it. People make mistakes. People get dirty. People become infected. The infection can't be near God. The way you fix the infection put on the rubber gloves, gown up, put the thing on, head in. They didn't have any of that stuff yet. Kill a bull, then walk in. Kill a bull, sprinkle the blood on, then come in. See what's going on there? So day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices. Again and again, over and over, they're killing lambs every morning every evening at the temple over and over offering sacrifices so that they can be in god's presence he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins but when this priest when this priest jesus had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins he sat down at the right hand of god and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. That's that shepherd guy who likes to kiss boo-boos of sheep, right? For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Okay, that should bring you to your feet, that line. If you are a highlighter, underliner circular kind of person in your bible that's one you need to get the stuff out and make sure you highlight circle underline because the holy spirit said print it that's good bible for by one sacrifice how many sacrifices now, i'm going to camp out on this a little bit because i can't tell you how often folks come to me and they feel guilty and they feel shame and they feel bad because of stuff they've done 
and they think, oh, I got to I gotta make it right with God somehow. I gotta, maybe I got to volunteer in the nursery. Yeah, that would fix things between me and God. Man, really? Like, there's not even forgiveness in the sacrifice of bulls and goats, and you think like going downstairs and changing derby diapers is going to make you right with God? Man, I can't figure out why I feel sin, and I feel this guilt, and I feel this shame. Maybe I just need to give 20 bucks. I'll, f- I'll pay God off. I'll feel better. I'll make a big donation, and that'll fix it. Maybe, I, you know, I'm feeling guilt and shame. I've done something wrong. The way to fix this is that I volunteer more. Steve, what do you need done at the church? I mean, and don't ask me to do like people stuff because they irritate me, but do you need something fixed around the church? You need a chair moved or maybe, maybe a light bulb replaced or something? Can you, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I need to fix stuff and I need to figure out how to make things right with God. So maybe I need to be on a board or a committee or maybe I... God forbid, run for office. Or I need to do something to fix this so that God accepts me. Clearly, they don't have this verse highlighted, circled, underlined, memorized. For by helping in the nursery, he has made perfect. For by giving 20 bucks, he has made perfect. For by being on a committee you hate being on. For by serving at the church. For by, no, it says for by one sacrifice, the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross, he has made perfect forever. How long is that? How about we make one of you stay here forever and let us know? Start counting. We'll come back next week, check in with you. Reached the forever yet? No. Oh, we'll be back next week and see how that's going for you. That's what pastors actually do all week long. We're just counting to forever. Because I only work Sundays. What else am I going to do with all my time? I just sit around and I count till forever. Because my job is to remind you that you will be here forever. That you are perfect forever. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, if you have declared him king, shepherd of your life, what does it say? Made perfect forever. Those who are being made holy. What's the point? You can't do it yourself. You cannot earn God's forgiveness. You cannot earn God's favor. There is nothing you can do to be good enough. You cannot merit it. It's a gift. It's given. Do you accept it or do you reject it? That's the question. And whenever we say, I'm sinful and I'm guilty and I feel shame, what can I do? We're rejecting it. We are rejecting this truth. We don't really believe it. Maybe in our brains, we get our brains around, yeah, 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 I know, but God will never, I can never live up to God's standards. I'll never be good enough. And thank God that one sacrifice he has made, who has made it? He has made, he has made me perfect for how long? For a a couple days until I fall off the bandwagon. No, forever. Do you believe it? Not do you get it. Do you believe it? Not do you understand it when you read it. Do you believe it? If one of y'all comes this week to me and says, I feel shame and guilt, and by the way, nobody's going to do it this week because I'm setting it up this way, but my guess is, like, give it a month or two or a year, it's going to wear off. Be like, I feel guilty and I probably should help out around the church a little bit. And I'll be like, gosh. Where's my stick? Can you hit people? In the name of Jesus. So that they understand that there is one sacrifice he has made perfect forever. Those who are being made holy. You don't have anything to do with it. Do you accept Jesus Christ or not? That's the question. 
You don't have anything to do with you being holy. You don't have anything to do with you being perfect. And you definitely don't have anything to do with forever. These are done to you, for you, by faith. Is that clear? Shall we move on? Because i got another 40 minutes. <laughs> he goes on. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their mind. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. If you haven't circled, highlight anything yet, that's another good one. I feel like God's angry at me, and he hates me. And da, 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 da. He doesn't even remember it. If you ask for forgiveness, if you have confessed, if you are seeking to change your life and move out of that, he forgets it. It's gone. I don't know how he does it. I wish I had that ability. I remember stuff. You remember stuff. We hold grudges. We defend ourselves. We keep people at arm's length. I don't know how he does it. He says, I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. The 20 bucks in the offering, the helping in the nursery, the volunteering is no longer necessary. Why on earth would anybody help with that stuff then? Now we're going to have a math, mass exodus out of out of, out of the nursery. People are going to come up and they're going to grab their 20 bucks, right? And everybody's going to be like, yeah, cool, okay. I'm, that's fine with me. If you're doing it to save your soul, get out of there. Get your money back. That's not what is going to save your soul. Jesus Christ, the new covenant, that's what saves you. And there is now no more sacrifices needed. You don't give money So that God goes, well, thank God you're on my team. I don't know where we would have come up with that last dollar. I have no idea how that would have happened. Thank God for you. And I'm not trying to put anybody down here. I'm just trying to help you understand that you give because you've been given to. You give and you serve because you see that your Savior, God in the flesh, became a baby subjected himself to middle school and high school, became a man, went around preaching weird sermons and parables, and folks didn't get it. And then humanity decided the best thing to do with this guy is to kill him. The best thing to do with God incarnate is to destroy him. That's what humanity thought. And we did it. We killed God. God died a more horrible death than I pray anyone here will ever experience. He was ridiculed and mocked and beaten and flogged and stabbed. They pulled him off the cross. They put him in a tomb, a borrowed tomb. Good thing, because he didn't need it for very long. And then he pulled off Easter's. He doesn't need your 20 bucks. You give it because you go, oh my gosh, look at what God has done for me. And if that doesn't motivate you to serve, if that, if that doesn't motivate you to give, if that doesn't motivate you to give your life to this king, to this shepherd, then I have to wonder if you get it. If you understand. If you know what this new covenant is. Man, he's got to land a plane. Right? How's God going to pull this new covenant off? God himself will have to come and initiate this new covenant. He did it. That's what Christmas is about. That's what Easter is about. That's what Jesus is about. Two, the Spirit of God will actually indwell people. Hmm. Do you realize that? I mean, we're pretty frozen chosen type of folks around here. 
you know, we don't get crazy and jump over the pews and people have a word of knowledge from the Lord and I got to take the mic from them and go, okay, that was weird. Quit talking, right? We don't have a lot of movement of the spirit kind of stuff, but I believe, do you believe the Holy Spirit indwells in you? He lives in you that the word of God, the, the, the laws of God have been written on your heart, that it is in your mind, that the Holy Spirit is in you. This is the new covenant that he has decided, I'm going to take the reins because two-thirds of your Bible is busy telling you how people can't do it. And the only way we're going to do this is if I live inside of you and pull it off for you. Crazy. And clearly there's more room on the slide, so there must be a third one. The new covenant means that God will define his people. This is where we get away from Israel and from Judah as the only parts of the new covenant. And his people will not be by their physical descent from Abraham, right? Our genealogies don't go to him. We're on the wrong side of the tracks. We're not in that family line, but by their spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. This will begin a brand new thing called sitting around for an hour on Sundays and being bored. Church. Is that what this is? No. Way cooler. It's the new covenant. Holy cow, I have so many more slides. I probably should just wrap it up. So Jesus comes. He dies on the cross. He includes us in this covenant. You and I, by faith in King Jesus, are now, Paul puts it this way, grafted in. We are in this new tree. Bruce Walkie puts it this way. It's a beautiful drawing. You have the roots, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You have Israel. They get the covenants, Abraham. Moses, David, right? We've gone through all those things. Exile, uh uh-oh, looks like the tree's about to fall apart. It's a mess. The exile happens. But then God says, I will bring a new covenant. I will bring them back to the land. I will bring a new people. So after the exile, that's the first time they're called Jews. It's after the exile. So then you have the Jews, they return. And then you have Jews who aren't following Jesus even though they're physically descended from, from Abraham, they ain't part of the tree. They're not following Jesus. What replaces them? Us folk, Gentiles, grafted in the church. Holy cow, that's cool. We should probably pray. Father God, thank you for Jeremiah 31, for these amazing passages. Thank you for the the pictures that we get in the Old Testament. Thank you that you didn't leave us systematic theology, which would have been really boring and dry. Thank you for stories. Thank you that we can mull over stories. We can think about stories. We can read stories over and over and over again and see new things. Open our eyes as we eat this book. Write your law in our hearts. Father, I pray for anyone here today who struggles with feeling guilt, who struggles with feeling shame. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would impress upon their spirit today. You would soak it into their bones, into the marrow of their being, that they would understand that Jesus Christ's sacrifice has made them perfect forever. Spirit. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Eat this book. Amen.